Hello, students. This is Professor McDermott. Well, uh, the fourth and last of the great early civilizations we're going to be talking about in this course is ancient China, and that's the uh, subject of this video lecture. Um, China got a somewhat later start than the other early civilizations, but by the second millennium BC it was um, flourishing. According to Chinese tradition, there were two dynasties of kings uh, before the Shang Dynasty, but uh, the Shang Dynasty is the first that we have any actual written records for, so the history of China comes into much sharper focus under the Shang Dynasty, uh, which lasted from about 1600 BC until 1045. Um, BC, according to our way of counting the years. Now this was a Bronze Age civilization, meaning that they had bronze and they used it to make the majority of their tools um, and weapons. Um, Chinese religion under the Shang is very interesting. Basically the king was considered to be the intermediary between the gods and, um, and human beings, and so if if the people of China had something that they wanted to pray for, they would take it to the king. And the king uh, would then pray to his dead ancestors. China has always had a tremendous amount of reverence for um, their ancestors, uh, living or dead. Um, and so the king would pray to his ancestors, and it was believed that the ancestors would then pass on um, the king's request to the gods and especially the supreme god who was called D, D-I, um, and hopefully uh, the gods would um, grant them. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the early uh, writing that we have from Shang China is connected to religion and prophecy, it comes to us in the form of what are called oracle bones. Oracle bones. Um, <clears throat> these were, um, well, sometimes they were the bones of water buffalo or cattle, or sometimes turtle shells um, were used for this. Um, so what they would do is they would take a hot iron poker, you know, like you use to stir up a fire, and they would put it in the fire and get it red hot, and then they would touch it to the bone or to the turtle shell, which of course would then um, crack. And uh, the priests of the Chinese religion believed that they could um, interpret these cracks so as to foretell um, the future. Uh, and so that's how the oracle bones worked. You see one there on your um, screen. Uh, you see the cracks and you see the inscription that the priest has put there to tell what he thought um, the cracks uh, meant. Uh, here's an interesting um, example. Uh, this has to do with one of the queens of China. Her name, she was known as Lady Hao, uh, and she asked the priest to do some uh, crack making for her. So here's, here's the inscription the priest put on. It says, crack making on day 21. QA the priest divined. Lady Howe will give birth, and it may not be good. After 31 days she gave birth. It really was not good. It was a girl. Um, and of course that's, you know, that's very offensive to us, but um, it's very, it, it's been an important part of Chinese history, uh, which originally was a very, very male-dominated um, society and so uh, when a woman would get pregnant there was a, a strong preference to have a boy. Uh, and this has even been felt in Chinese history in the very um, recent past. You know uh, there was a communist revolution in China in 1949 and of course China is the most populated country in the world so when the communists took over they decided to try to control the population and they announced that from that point forward every couple was only allowed to have one baby um, on penalty of law. If you had more than one child you would um, be subject to severe penalties from the government. Um, but then when uh, abortion became uh, available uh, widely in China uh, what started to happen was that, and, and ultrasounds, 
what started to happen was that people would do ultrasounds, the couple would find out the baby was a girl and they would abort it. Um, and that led to a huge imbalance in the population with many more men um, than women. And this became a huge social problem in China in the recent past because um, when you have a society where you have lots and lots of single men running around who can't find wives, well, that, that's a problem. And so very recently, the Chinese government announced that from now on, couples are allowed to have two babies, not just one, in hopes that they would not do that to their girl um, babies. And we can certainly hope that will be the case. Um, well, um, Lady Hao, uh, although she was living in a very male-dominated society, seems to have been a very important woman in that society. We, she was the wife of King Wu Ding, and we know she was considered very important because in her grave, in her tomb, uh, there are the remains of 16 people who were killed in order to uh, accompany her to the afterlife. So the Chinese did practice this form of human sacrifice, something that the Egyptians um, did not uh, do. All right, <clears throat> how did the Shang Dynasty come to an end? Well, we know about this from the works of the great historian um, Suma Qin. Uh, according to Suma Qin's account, the last king of the Shang dynasty was a tyrant. In other words, he was a cruel and corrupt ruler who oppressed the people. Um, and Suma Qin went on to explain that in Chinese culture, the king is considered the son of heaven, and he rules because he has what's called the mandate of heaven. In other words, the approval of the gods. But if a king behaves badly um, and does evil things in the sight of the gods, they can withdraw that mandate, that approval. And according to Suma Qin, that's what happened to the last Shang king, who in 1045 BC was overthrown by the king of a neighboring region called Zhao, King Wu of Zhao. And um, in his war against the last Shang king, King Wu had the help from a tribe called the Qiang, um, who were happy to fight alongside him because they were often the victim of the human sacrifices that I just mentioned. So with the help of the Chang, uh, who wanted to put an end to the human sacrifices, King Wu of Zhao overthrew the Shang dynasty in 1045 BC um, and became uh, the king of China, and we call this the beginning of the Shao dynasty. Under the Shao kings, you see what's called a feudal system, in China. This is a concept we'll see later in other societies, especially Europe during the Middle Ages. When you have a feudal system, it means that underneath the king you have um, lords and ladies, people with titles of nobility, who also play an important role in um, society. So in Europe you see people with titles like um, duke or count or, or marquis or knight um, and so forth. Um, and so the, the Zhao kings used these lords uh, underneath them for their administration. They were basically government employees who carried out important tasks for uh, the kings. This is what we call a feudal system. Also under the Zhao kings, we see China expanded uh, quite a bit. If you look at this map, you see the green area is China under the Shang dynasty. But under the Zhao rulers, um, uh, it expanded to include all of that area in purple. So we can say that under the Xiao, uh, China really starts to become a superpower uh, in the Far East. However, as inevitably happens in human societies, um, as the Xiao dynasty went on, uh, China began to experience a period of uh, decline. It was no longer as great or as powerful or as unified as it had been under the early Xiao uh, rulers, and we call this the Spring and Autumn period between 722 and 481 BC. It's called that, it's named that after a work of literature that was produced during this period. But it was a very significant period in Chinese history because it was during the Spring and Autumn period that one of China's greatest uh, philosophers appeared. In Chinese, his name is Kang Fuzi, but 
in the West, we usually uh, speak of him using the Latin form of his name, which is um, Confucius. <laughs> and sometimes if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you get a fortune cookie, <clears throat> uh, the fortune will start by saying, oh, Confucius say blah, 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 you know, <laughs> which is really too bad uh, that, that Confucius has been trivialized in that way because he is one of the great um, thinkers of world history. Confucius was very interested in society and in politics. In fact, he wanted to try to bring back the glory days of the early Xiao kings. In a way, he wanted to try to make China great again. <laughs> um, by returning to the, the great principles that he saw as the foundation of um, Chinese society. And essentially, there were three important principles that Confucius thought could help to um, bring back the great glory days of the early Xiao. The first uh, is Li in the Chinese language. Li essentially means um, courtesy, good manners, okay, and, and Confucius took this, to, took this to the point where being courteous to others and showing good manners almost becomes like a religious ritual uh, for him. It's very um, he had a, he had a very complex idea of a code of manners that people should follow in society so that they would show respect to others especially people that were higher than they were in uh, the order of society uh, such as lords and ladies um, and also to one's elders and one's um, ancestors uh, you were supposed to show tremendous lee or courtesy towards them um, and, uh, you know, it may seem that this is not very important in our society, but actually, if you think about it, I, I bet you can think of several ways that people uh, show ritual courtesy towards others. For instance, um, when someone sneezes and, and, and the person will say, God bless you, or just bless you, I, I think that's an example of Li. Or uh, opening the door for someone. If you come to a door at the same time, you open the door for them. Um, that would be an example of Lee. And, and I think even for us, if someone didn't do that, if someone slammed the door in our face when we were right behind them, we would think, gosh, that person is a real jerk. <laughs> you know, and it's little gestures like that that really help um, society to work, you know, more peacefully and more harmoniously. And Confucius understood that with this concept of Li. Um, the second important Confucian concept, Ren, this in a way was the keystone of Confucius's whole um, way of thinking. Ren means basically showing kindness or benevolence to others. That means being generous and very good to others. Basically showing uh, a great humaneness or humanity towards other human beings. Um, Confucius believed that if everyone would do this, then um, society would work, uh, would work better. Finally, um, the third important Confucian concept, Zhao. <clears throat> This is what the Romans called filial piety. They, they had this quality too. Um, and again, it's just that respect for one's elders and respect for ancestors. In Chinese culture, old people have always been highly valued as a source of uh, wisdom and experience and have been treated with um, great respect and also dead ancestors. Um, if you go to a Chinese uh, <clears throat> cemetery, I'm told, you will find that people leave offerings of food on the graves of their ancestors. You know, in our society, we would leave flowers, but um, in their society, they leave gifts of um, food uh, as if to nourish those departed ancestors in the afterlife. Um, and this is an important sign of Xiao. And Confucius thought this was very important for society. Um, and also to show Xiao towards, again, the people that were higher ranking than you in society. So the people that were lower class should show great respect and obedience and deference toward the people of the upper class. However, Confucius also believed that upper class people should show benevolence, humanity, generosity towards people that were beneath them. And if all classes did that, then society would be truly harmonious, people would get along, uh, it would be prosperous and happy. Um, so to sum it all up, Confucius wanted a hierarchical society, that is with different social classes, some people higher than others, but 
Um, also a society that was very harmonious, where everybody followed important ancient traditions and um, used those traditions in order to get along and cooperate with each other. And finally, I want to say that Confucianists, people that follow the teachings of Confucius, wanted to be very active in society. They really wanted to make the world a better place by getting involved in politics and government and so forth. So this Confucianism was a very active life. They really wanted to be very involved in making the world a better place. However, <clears throat> Confucianism was not the only important philosophy in ancient China. Another really important tradition down to the present day is what we call Taoism. Yes, I know it's spelled with a D. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese, but for some reason we pronounce that D like a T, so we call it Taoism. Um, the philosophy of Taoism springs from a book which is called the Tao Te Ching that was written down in the 6th century BC. Um, this has been translated in English as the Way and Integrity Classic. And the name of the author that's been assigned to this book is Lao Tzu. We don't really know if Lao Tzu actually existed as a person. Um, but anyway, that's the traditional name that's been assigned as the author of this book. Um, what the Tao Te Ching is about is the Tao. Uh, the Tao is like the law of nature, um, the way of nature. Taoists believe that um, God or the gods have put a law into the world that every human being has to follow. And in fact, everything, every, every creature, uh, everything in the universe has to follow this law of the Tao. Um, and human beings must follow it in order to lead a happy life. So a Taoist would have a very different kind of life than a Confucianist. For the Taoist, the most important thing was to learn about the Tao and to follow the Tao in your own individual life. And so the goal was not to be very active and involved in society, but rather to lead a very quiet, humble life in a way to kind of drop out of society, <laughs> not be a real active person so that you would have more time to study the Tao. <clears throat> uh, so it was like a quiet, very philosophical life withdrawn from, um, from society. Um, and in this way, <laughs> it's interesting, the Taoists were, were kind of laid back people, you know, they were not like type A people, they were, they were more laid back than the Confucianists, and they were more passive. Um, and uh, Taoism first really came, became popular in this country during the 1960s, when, when, as you may know, there was a movement called the Hippie Movement, or the Counterculture Movement, in which large numbers of young people especially, essentially dropped out of society trying to find themselves and, and to find a better, more peaceful way of life. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, the Taoist ideas kind of became popular in American culture during the 1960s because they were very similar to what the so-called hippies uh, were doing. All right, I want to, the, the Taoist sayings though, you're going to read some Taoist sayings alongside some Confucianist sayings. The Taoist sayings are a little confusing. <laughs> um, so I just want to look at a few of them just to give you a general idea that may help, help you uh, as you read them. There isn't any one like true interpretation of these sayings. They're deep philosophical sayings. So um, you can come up with your own ideas about them. But, but just to give you a little guidance here, okay, one Taoist saying from the Tao Te Ching it goes like this, perfect mastery works like water. For position, favor lower ground. Okay, so you know, um, like imagine there's a hill, right? And it's raining. Um, well, the water that falls on the top of the hill is not gonna stay at the top of the hill, or is it? It's gonna flow down the hill to the bottom of the hill, right? Um, that's the image that's being offered here, okay? And so for the Taoists, they didn't want to try to climb their way to the top of the hill, the top of the heap, you know, like some Confucianists did. They were not trying to make it in society and be high status people. They wanted to go down to the lower place in society to be, again, to be very simple, very humble, very quiet, like water, flow down to the lowest place, not strive um, to climb the ladder of success. Um, here's another uh, Taoist saying. 
um, that's very intriguing, I think. It says, to care for the people and rule the kingdom, must you not master underacting? Must you not play the female part? And this connects with the traditional belief that, that while men are more active, females are more passive, more shy and retiring and so forth. Um, and we could certainly question that belief. But what I think is very interesting here is that in this male-dominated society, this Taoist text essentially is saying, no, you should really, um, you should really follow the female principle, yin, not the male principle, yang. You may have seen the yin-yang diagram. Some people get it, you know, in a tattoo or whatever. <laughs> uh, you can Google yin-yang and you'll see the famous diagram um, showing the male and female principle in balance. Uh, but the female principle was yin, and the Taoists wanted people to be more yin. They wanted people essentially to have a more, quote-unquote, passive feminine approach to life rather than an active masculine striving um, approach. And, and that, I think, in a male-dominated society like China was pretty remarkable. Finally, uh, this may be the most famous Taoist saying of all, um, bend to not break, bend to not break. What could that possibly mean? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I am kind of a type A person, and, and I, so I know from experience that people like that who get very stressed out about things and are, um, you know, have rigid standards and, and procedures and things they want to follow and like to follow rules and so forth, um, a lot of times that approach can be very risky, you know, because you can get wrapped too tight and you can really stress yourself out that way and you might end up even having a breakdown, you know, uh, breaking if you take that rigid approach to life. Well, the Taoists are saying, no, you need to be more flexible, you know. If you don't want to break, you have to bend a little bit, you know, meet people halfway. Um, again, be a little more laid back and not as stressed out about things. So. I hope that gives you some insight into Taoism. Like I said, you're going to be reading um, some texts from both Con the Con uh, Confucius and from the Tao Te Ching um, for your reading questions. And this is also going to factor into your next uh, reflection assignment as well. All right. So um, I want to talk about another important period of early Chinese history. This has been labeled the Warring States period. We'll come back to the slide, but I just want to show you on the map that during the Warring States period, as it's called, from 403 to 221 BC, China split up into several smaller nations, which were constantly at war with each other, hence this name, the Warring States period. Um, partly that happened because of the arrival of iron in China. Um, iron weapons being stronger than bronze weapons. Um, those regions which got iron first were at an advantage and they were able to make war on other regions very effectively using their new iron weapons. And so that led to the, the splintering or disintegration of China during the Warring States period. And of course it meant that each of the warring states had to have a very large army to try to defend itself from the other warring states. And so during this warring states period, the science, military science, you could say, really made great um, steps forward. Um, being a general was a very prized possession, um, or profession, excuse me. Um, and in fact, some of the classic books in military history were written during the warring states period in China, the most famous by a general named Sun Tzu is called The Art of War. Um, and if any of you ever go to grad school in business to get an MBA, uh, I bet you may end up reading The Art of War <laughs> by Sun Tzu because actually a lot of the principles that Sun Tzu sets forth for military uh, purposes are actually also applicable to business where you're trying to get an edge on your um, competitors. So uh, any business out majors out there, you may find this interesting. Um, also during the Warring States period, a, a third great Chinese philosophy emerged called legalism. Um, and pay, pay close attention here because this will also factor into your next reflection assignment. Legalism was very different from both Taoism and um, Confucianism. It was a very practical philosophy, very hard-headed, very realistic. 
it was really all about power, how to get power, how to hold on to power, how to keep power. Um, and in order to do that, legalists believed that you had to establish systems of control uh, to control the people underneath you in society, and the best way to do that was through law, by um, using uh, law and the legal system to control the people. The uh, Legalists were not interested in using religion for that purpose. They, unlike the Confucianists, they had very little interest in um, religious uh, rituals. They also did not like the idea of a feudal system where people would get jobs simply because of the family that they were born into, because they were born into an upper class uh, family. So legalists believed that all jobs, all government jobs in society, for instance, being a general of the army or high government official, <clears throat> should be assigned to the, the people that performed the best, who were the smartest, who were the hardest working, not necessarily people that were born into noble or aristocratic families. So in that way, um, the legalists, I think, were similar to you know our modern American way of doing things, where we believe that anybody can rise to the top through hard work and know-how, uh, no matter where they start out at in society. Um, all right, so what were some of the laws that legalists put in place um, to try to consolidate their power over society? Um, well, first of all, under in, in, in areas and in countries that were influenced by legalism, you see um, that all households had to register uh, a kind of census, uh, so counting the people, counting the number of households, so that it became easier to tax uh, people for the amount of land they own and thus bring in more money uh, for the government and increasing the power of the state. Also, um, legalists advocated the creation of a military draft, in other words, a system where young men would be drafted into the army. Um, obviously, we still have to register for the draft um, today for selective service, even though it hasn't been implemented since the 1970s. Um, it still is a possibility in our society. Well, that kind of dates back to this ancient Chinese invention of the military draft. Um, now, one region of China that was greatly influenced by legalism was um, Qin. If you see here on the map, there's the large kind of salmon-colored region in the west of China. The kings of Qin really adopted the legalist philosophy as their own, and that helped Qin to become uh, the strongest and most powerful of the warring states uh, close to the end of the warring states period. And it enabled the king of Qin, King Zheng, in 221 BC to conquer all of the other warring states, to reunify China, um, and to establish himself as the king or ruler of China. And when, when he did that, King Zheng decided to take a new title, and he became known as Qin Shi Huangdi, which means the first August emperor, the first great emperor of China. So uh, Qin Shi Huangdi was the first emperor of China, and uh, ever after there would be an emperor of China down, actually into the 20th century, um, I believe it was in 1912 that the last emperor Puyi was uh, finally uh, overthrown, but there was an emperor from 221 BC right up into the 20th century. Uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, following the legalist philosophy, had many great um, accomplishments that did help to make China stronger and more efficient. He divided the whole kingdom into 42 districts and he appointed rulers, governors over the districts, again based on merit, based on performance, not based on the fact that they came from a noble family. And so the administration was pretty efficient uh, with all the taxes he was collecting using legalist methods. Um, and the uh, labor that he was coercing out of people um, Chen Shi Huangdi was able to build about 4,000 miles of new highways in China 
and even to begin build the Great Public's Work Project that we call the Great Wall of China, a great symbol of China, um, down to the present day. But the thing that Chen Shi Huangdi is most famous for, <laughs> uh, he was obsessed with having a great afterlife. So like the Egyptian pharaohs, the rulers of China uh, would try to build magnificent tombs for themselves and fill them with um, beautiful things uh, to accompany them to the afterlife so they could enjoy themselves more. And Chen Shi Huangdi really went all out uh, with his um, tomb. Uh, which was lost for many years until a farmer in China in the 1970s stumbled across some archaeological remains and alerted the authorities and they came and started digging and what they found was absolutely mind-blowing in fact this tomb is so huge that um, the whole thing hasn't even been excavated yet they haven't even found Chen Shi Huangdi's body yet because it's just so immense they haven't had time to excavate the whole thing but one of the first things they started digging out was a huge enormous chamber which contained several thousand statues of soldiers the terracotta warriors you may have heard of this each statue is different each statue looks different they're in they're like individual soldiers carefully modeled to be absolutely unique and the idea was that these thousands of warriors would protect their Emperor Chen Shi Huangdi um, in um, the afterlife. And um, this tomb had great rivers of mercury that were flowing through it. Um, absolutely magnificent. And in order to keep it secret so that nobody, nobody would know where it was to rob it, um, Chen Shi Huangdi ordered that um, all of the workers on the tomb complex would be killed and would be buried in the tomb along with him. So there are also lots of human sacrifices in the tomb along with him. And um, I guess he did succeed in keeping it secret because like I said, it was not discovered until the 1970s. But um, I want you to learn a little bit more about this and about the philosophy of legalism, which like I said, will feed into your next reflection assignment. Uh, and so to that end, uh, now that you've finished the lecture, I have a short video clip posted in this week's folder that I want you to watch. Um, it's from a documentary called The Emperor's Ghost Army. So look for the link that says Emperor's Ghost Army. I've just re-recorded a small clip about 11 minutes talking about the tomb and the terracotta warriors and the ruthless but very effective um, legalist methods. <laughs> Uh, that went into making the tomb. So if you would, now that this lecture is over, please flip over and just watch that short 11-minute um, video that will really help you on the next uh, reflection assignment.